Hi, I'm Amy Willis with EconLib, and I am delighted to have with me today my good friend and professor of economics, Steve Horwitz. Steve, do you want to introduce yourself, please? I would be happy to. Uh, I'm Steve Horwitz. Uh, that's with one O. Uh, I am the Distinguished Professor of Free Enterprise and Director of the Institute for the Study of Political Economy in the Miller College of Business at Ball State University in Muncie. Great. Thanks so much for being with us, Steve. Um, as our econ log readers know, uh, we allowed people a, almost a week to enter some questions for you. So we're doing an Ask Me Anything. Um, I would like to apologize to a lot of our readers in advance insofar as we received an awful lot of questions and time won't permit us uh, to answer all of them, but we will do our best. Um, I've also uh, put some questions that were similar in nature together uh, just to make it a little bit easier for us to get through as many kinds of questions as we can. But let's start with something really basic, Steve, uh, and several people asked a version of this, but Thaddeus from Buffalo in particular says, do you think that the general public has a poor understanding of what economic systems are and how markets work? And if that's true, does that contribute to why people don't recognize how much markets enrich our lives? Yeah, I think, I think that is correct. I think that people don't understand how they work. Uh, and it's, it's out of ignorance, not out of hatred necessarily. I think they literally don't understand how they work. In particular, people don't understand the role that prices play. I mean, this is the big debate that's going on right now. The role that prices play in signaling us about, about what to do and how best to do it. And I think when you don't understand that, you, it's, more diff, it's, more, it's more difficult to appreciate sort of what markets do, how they provide. And, and it's even in a crisis situation like we're in right now, right? The fact, yeah, there's some empty store shelves, but they're getting restocked, not perfectly. And I think it's really important to emphasize markets aren't perfect. Things don't happen instantaneously. They're just, as, as, as the question said, as a system, they're just better than all the alternatives. And, and unlike Venezuela, where the unstocked shelves go on and on and on, right here, at least they come, they come back. Some of them come back, more of them come back. And, and we're starting to see that already. Yeah. So several people also ask questions about the business sector or private businesses in particular. Um, how do you think that this sort of lack of understanding of markets and prices translates into people's attitudes toward businesses? And yeah. several people, in fact, said, well, Professor Horowitz, is it really true that all businesses are essential businesses? Yeah. Well, OK. So so let's let's save the essential thing for, for the end of this answer. But but I think, you know, uh, it might well be ironically that one of the things that comes out of the current crisis is a little bit more respect and understanding for the role of the private sector. So, I mean, we, you know, uh, uh, not only have stores tried their hardest, there's a great story out today about HEB down in Texas, right, yeah. to sort of keep shelves stocked and to even having sort of, you know, corporate office people come in and stock shelves and, and to recognize this problem and, and, and make it happen. And you begin to see just how hard that work is and how much people who run those stores and so forth care about, about getting it right. And so it may well be that we get a little more respect out of this. Plus, the conversion stuff, right? The alcohol places turning into making hand sanitizer, you know, and, 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 and the, the, the fabric places making masks. I mean, all this kind of stuff is amazing. And what's important about that is it's happening without direction. It's not like World War II where the government said, you now have to make B-52s and tanks, right? These people are seeing the price signals and, and, and changing it. So this question, are, are there any, you know, what does it mean essential businesses, non-essential businesses? I mean, yeah, in one sense, there's no such thing as a non-essential business. A everything is essential in the sense that somebody wants it, somebody's willing to pay for it, and somebody's making, somebody's jobs depend on it, right? Um, on the other hand, right, I mean, I think you, you know, in the context of a public health crisis, I think you can carefully draw some lines. They're always gonna be arbitrary, they're never gonna be perfect, but if it's true, that physical distancing, social distancing, and all these sorts of things are important to keeping this thing under control, then I think you can draw some lines. It's always gonna be arbitrary. There's gonna be rent seeking galore as people try to get on one side or the other of it. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't, it, it isn't necessary at some level. Yeah. How you make the distinction, I'm not positive, but, but I do think, it's not, it's not a ridiculous distinction to make. That's the $2 trillion question, right? right. So I'm going to ask you uh, in a moment to explain what you mean by rent seeking. And we're going to come back to some more specific questions about um, the measures that we've undertaken in response to the coronavirus. Um, but let's, for the meantime, let's get back to some sort of economic education related questions. And this next one is from our mutual friend, Rachel, who says, we all know that division of labor makes us richer. 
as long as we have access to the output of other workers. But in cases like this, where it's disrupted, we no longer have the abilities to access the whole supply chain. And she says, my kids and I, um, and I share this fear with Rachel, frankly, uh, live in fear of the day that I will need to cut their hair because I can no longer outsource it to someone else. <laughs> my my kid is running from me. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> so, but more seriously, she says, there are many products in our economy that need coordination and cooperation. Yeah. Products that we rely on from far away that aren't available, maybe because of airline shutdowns, maybe because of rules arbitrary or not about essential businesses and so forth. So what she wants to know basically is, did the extreme specialization of our economy make us too vulnerable and fragile right. in the case of this disruption? I think that's an outstanding question and it is the cost, right? It's clearly the cost of, a, of the increasingly narrow and fine division of labor, which gives us these specializations, which enables us to live these fabulous lives of people who just, like our groomer just does doodles. Right, that's, that's a pretty narrow special, it's great, but it's yeah. a pretty narrow specialization, right? And that's awesome, but you're exactly right. There, that, that does make us vulnerable. We no longer ourselves have the skills, right, to, 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 to do the things that we rely on others to do. Is it, you know, it's worth it, right? We wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have the resources to sort of skate through this, to, to glide through this if, if we didn't. But that's the cost, absolutely no question. The cost is we're gonna, as someone said, we're gonna find out what the real color of a lot of people's hair is over the next <laughs> few weeks. And, and yeah, oh, no. I, mean, I, can, I can think of lots of examples of that. And, and, and you know, maybe one thing that comes out of it is, is we, we learn, we get a little bit more, you know, able to do some of those things ourselves in ways that we couldn't. It's not bad to have that option open to you if you need it while you still can go out in the market and purchase those services. Sure. Yeah, uh, my son and I, I suspect Rachel's kids are not willing to be a part of this grand experiment with no, haircutting, no. but you know. Understandably. <laughs> so here's a more specific question about markets and particular products. So Alice from New York City says that some of her students are flummoxed by the shortages of the N95 masks in the city at this time of crisis. And they don't understand why, and I'm using the scare quotes that she did, New York State doesn't do something about it. And even after full lessons and price signaling and markets, there's this tendency for her students to believe in the magical powers of government. How can you help Alice defuse this with her students? Well, I think the easiest question to ask is where, where are they coming from? Where, where are these masks that whether it's prices and profits or it's the government's going to make appear? I mean, I, I, again, I haven't read closely, but my understanding in that particular case is that there's a whole bunch of regulations that have prevented those masks from coming to market. So in fact, it's the very New York state that you want to solve the problem that is responsible for having created at least some of it in the first place, right? And so uh, the N95s are out there, right? They're, they're up, Pacific Northwest has them because it's forest fires, right? So, so part of the problem here is how do we get them to go to where they need to go? And all this medical stuff is is so... Uh, uh, regulated and, and, and has been so regulated for so long, we just don't know how to free it up to make these things happen. I mean, one of the interesting things that might also come out of this is actually we've seen some deregulation in the, in the medical sector temporarily. Things that, you know, libertarians and liberals have wanted to see for a long time are happening, yeah. and, and, which is great. Let's hope it sticks. The irony, of course, is that meanwhile, you know, the very same people who are seeing their, some of their fondest dreams come true are saying a variety of idiotic things, but that's a different, that's a different problem. Well, I, I had a similar conversation with our friend David Henderson the other day, and we talked about some of these things that are being deregulated, right? Yeah. The, within the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. uh, licensure laws, all yeah. that's great. Um, we remain somewhat afraid of what other sorts of new regulations, you know, sort of come alongside those right. deregulations. Right. But right. Um, a, a general question about price controls. Um, our friend Danny in West Virginia wonders if there's any evidence, or if not evidence, do you have a hunch that you and other economists of our ilk have been teaching about the errors of price controls and whether that's had any effect during this particular crisis? Well, it's an interesting question. I, you know, just anecdotally, I don't think I've seen as much, pol po you know, sort of political demagoguery and, and pro attempts at prosecution. There's been a couple, right? And Amazon got spanked and Menard got spanked. And so there's, you know, some, uh, but, but I don't, I, I don't, ju judging by the quick response to the segment I just did on NPR about this and defending, letting prices rise, I'm not sure we've made a big dent of any kind. Maybe it's, maybe a small one, 
right? And, and, and which is why we need to just keep teaching the basics uh, and teaching it in intro and teaching it in high school and doing the best we can to raise a generation, new generations that understand this point, right? And recognize that, that, that the real choice is between high prices and supplies of the good and low prices and nothing. Nope. But that's the choice. There's no magic wand that gives us abundant supply and low prices when we're in an emergency. Room. It just right. isn't the option on the table. And New York State can't make it happen either. <laughs> no, no. Well said. And we'll be hopeful for some of the fruits of economic education, which, you know, we've all been working towards for so long. So now I have a bunch of questions uh, from readers and listeners that are pretty specific to the coronavirus issue. So we'll start with this one. This is sort of an, an amalgam question. Uh, Robert in Los Angeles and James from Michigan wonder sort of similar things here. So I'm, I've tried to put them together. So how do you think we should be thinking about the immediate mortality risks of coronavirus? versus the longer term increase to all cause mortality that might result from economic damage uh, wrought by the efforts to combat the yeah. coronavirus. Yeah. Um, and uh, why isn't there a bigger push for ways to combat coronavirus that aren't as costly? Uh, yeah. So we just talked about some of those things with regard to deregulation and so forth. Yeah. But if you want to expand on that a little bit, yeah. um, they'd appreciate okay, I want to be, be careful off the top and say, you know, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'm not going to wade into that stuff. But I think the question is, is, is this, right? We just need to recognize that there's no costless solution here. If we start doing, you know, the things that we have done by basically shutting down the economy to try to flatten the curve and do all those, those may well be the right epidemiological choices to make, but they come with a big cost. And, and, and this is not an economic, this is not like some abstract economic cost. I think one of the things that's been driving me crazy is, is, is the people who want to divide economic costs from human costs. No, economic costs are, are human, human costs. costs. Right. And so when we shut down the economy, these are, you know, unemployment is, is horrific as a public health problem. If you're unemployed for, for, for periods of time, your odds of, of getting all, having, contracting all kinds of problems, not just disease, but psychological stuff is, is significant and, and costly. And so there's, it's not like there's no cost, no human cost, right? And I don't mean like, you know, people losing their jobs in and of itself, but no human, no health cost, right? To shutting down the economy. And people just have not thought about that. I think in any, you know, real sophisticated way. And I do think, you know, I, I've been harping on my fellow economists for wading into waters they shouldn't wade in, but this is different. This is what we do, right? We talk about trade-offs. We, we, we talk about unintended consequences. We remind people of, of what can happen if you do X instead of Y. And I think that's really important in this case to, to continue that reminder and, and to say, look, there's real human cost to shutting down the economy. Maybe it's still the right thing to do. Maybe it is, but we better have a pretty good accounting and at least recognize it. When, when, when Governor Cuomo gets out and says, says if, if we save one life, it's worth it. No, it's the first thing we teach in Econ 101. No, it's not worth it to save one life. How many lives is it worth? That's the tough question. And which sort of thing should we do? Very difficult questions, but questions we need to ask. Yeah, the sorts of questions that have long made us unpopular at cocktail parties, right? But <laughs> right, exactly. Well, that's you know, or 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 getting hate mail, you know. From uh, yeah, yeah. No, exactly right. Yeah, no, I think that was very well said. Um, so again, related to the coronavirus, and we talked a little bit about this with the question on division of labor. But what do you say? Uh, this is from listener Mary. She wants to know what do you say to the argument that despite comparative advantage, it's a bad idea to have all of a country's steel mills, pharmaceutical companies, medical supply manufacturers move abroad. Um, because what happens in the case of war or pandemic or some other interruption of supply chains? Yeah. Uh, so a couple things I'd respond to that. First of all, I don't think that they've all moved abroad, right? I mean, we have plenty still domestically and, and the, the comparative advantage doesn't necessarily say that everyone goes to one place or everyone goes to the other, right? That, but we find out where people have the, the, the least, least cost of production. So that's one. Two, it's kind of like Rachel's question, right? At some level, you say, look, there, there's a risk involved to the degree that we are dependent upon other countries to get these things. And they have made it possible for us to have this abundance of resources that we now can, again, sort of rely on to get us through this process. Everyone knows, right, that, that what, the finer the division of labor, the more narrow comparative advantages, the more we risk precisely this sort of thing. But the question is, what's the alternative, right? Would, would, would we restructure the economy to, to make us poorer because we're afraid of a once every however many years event, 
that, that would, that would make this difficult. I don't think it's worth it. Maybe, maybe Mary does, maybe others do, but I don't think it's worth it. And so, so this is just the cost. One of markets again are not perfect. This is one of the costs or risks we take by, from a system that has made us fabulously rich. I think Steve, that's an argument that we need to make all the more forcefully now, right? That markets yeah. aren't perfect, right? right. I mean, right. sometimes we're accused of saying, oh, well, you know, markets will solve everything. Well, right. no. The, the, the store, <laughs> right. The store shelves aren't fully stocked. Well, right. no, of course they're not fully stocked, right? That's not how it works. Well, some, some models and, you know, but, but in the real world, right, uh, that's not how it works. But the, the question, look, one of the first things I learned in grad school is as compared to what, yeah. right? That's, you know, the question always is comparative. How well does this system do compared to that system? Nothing, nothing in this life is perfect. And, and, and you're right. We need to be upfront and honest about that, especially now. Yeah, I, I think so. All right. So um, Alex from Ottawa in Canada has some questions. Um, and he always with, has questions. <laughs> so we've touched on this a little bit, but I, I want to get your, um, your feedback on a couple of these things. So libertarians, he says, or classical liberals have been thus far divided on the justifiability of things like quarantines and lockdowns that have been instituted. Yeah. Um, what's your view on the justifiability of these measures? <sighs> this crisis has been the hardest thing I think I've ever faced as a libertarian because on one, at one level, my instinct is to say, stop it, <laughs> right? Stop it. Stop locking us down. Stop preventing our freedom of movement. All these kind of things. But at another level, there are enough people whose expertise I think is valid, right? There's nothing about libertarianism that should deny the expertise of the valid expertise of, 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 of valid experts, right? Who are saying, these steps are necessary to prevent a much greater harm. Now, look, I'm I'm a I'm a utilitarian in that sense, right? I'm a I'm a I'm a consequentialist. So for me, right, okay, I'm I'm willing to accept some short-run losses of liberty because I'm persuaded that they will prevent a much bigger loss of life down the road. You know, and some of this is personal with me. I'm I'm in more than one high-risk group, so containing this thing and keeping it the hell away from me right, is really, really important. And I'll admit that bias, but, but I'm, I'm pretty confident, even without that bias, that at least some of the things that have been done are, are justifiable. Uh, I, it, I don't like my, the libertarian in me. is not happy about that. But this is an extraordinary circumstance, and, and I, don't, I don't see an, a better alternative. So a couple things on that. One is that's a really striking admission uh, and, and a brave admission, too, to say that this is the hardest thing uh, that you've had to oh. deal with as, as a libertarian. I agree with that uh, statement. <laughs> Not even close. Yeah. yeah um, I agree with that a lot. Um, and again, you know, sort of the libertarian in me chafes at, what do you mean I can't go here, there, or everywhere? Right. But by the same token, right, I think um, many of us are at a point where we know people who have been affected by this directly, right? And so that's that makes things different. Um, so just out of curiosity, I had a conversation with Scott Sumner and Arnold Kling the other day, and Arnold has an interesting proposal. Yes. Um, he says, uh, for those who haven't seen it, he says that rather than have this sort of lockdown, which restricts our freedom of movement, would it be better, and so now I'm putting this question to you, would it be better instead of restricting our freedom of movement, restricting restricting how we go about that movement? In particular, Arnold was advocating masks or scarves or something so, you know, we're like this, uh, and we could still be out and about with perhaps a lesser possibility of transmitting the virus. What do you think? Uh, I think there's some truth to that, right? I mean, you know, uh, I've gotten used, to, I'm not wearing my mask now because it just didn't seem appropriate for this, but, but I'm wearing a mask, you know, anytime I leave the house, I'm wearing a mask, right? Yeah. And even in the house, I'm supposed to be wearing it. I'm not always, my doctors aren't listening, but, but you know. We hope. <laughs> right, I'm supposed to be wearing it in the house yeah. too. And, and, you know, it helps. Um, and it's we, Asian countries, you go around, I was in, in Japan, sort of at the edge of SARS, and people were walking around with masks, and then that, for them, it's, that's what they do. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, it's, bo it's, it's, it's both, for me, it's, it's not about me infecting you, it's about you infecting me, right? And so, so I think there's, there's a kind of cozy in, you know, which way are we going here? But yeah, I think, I mean, I think there, I, I think we've probably gone too far, and I think there are some ways we can let people let people out and, and let them let them do some things uh, with the expectation that they would mask 
or for certain sorts of things, wear gloves. Um, you know, I, I still don't, it's, it's probably the case that sort of bars and restaurants and those large gatherings are a bad idea, but it doesn't seem to me, for example, to churches and synagogues and so forth, seem different to me. I don't know. So, so I'm thinking, you know, but the problem is, is getting people to do it and, and, and enforcing it. There's a huge collective action problem there. Yeah. Right. And, and I don't know how you solve that. Uh, but, but, you know, again, this is the hard part for libertarians. I'm tempted to say better to go a little too far than not, but I'm not sure I believe that either. So, so I don't know. I honestly, I, like I said, I, so much of this I read and I go, I don't know. I just yeah. don't know. And, and, and it's hard, frankly, when it's so personal too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the word of the day for the last many, many days running is unprecedented, right? I mean, yeah, how many right. times That's a day right. do we hear that? This is, a, this is an unprecedented situation. So let's, um, let's take a look at this from sort of the opposite or, or a different perspective. And that's this. Um, so again, libertarians, classical liberals uh, are generally opposed to sort of financial compensation, stimulus packages, things of that nature. But um, do you think it's inconsistent to support some sort of financial compensation or assistance to people who have lost their jobs because of the virus? And somewhere in there, I want to come back to this notion of rent seeking, which you introduced yeah. later. So if you could, so, if you could try to wrap that in, that'd be cool. Okay. So when you brought up Arnold Kling a minute ago, I thought you were going to talk about his other proposal, which is the the overdraft protection idea, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Right. And so so what he's proposed is rather than write stupid checks to people. And we got to stop using the word stimulus here. This isn't about stimulus. This isn't yeah. macro. This is, this is a, like a form of insurance almost, or, or as you say, sort of a compensation for something that is nobody, I mean, nobody's fault, but the decision made by governments to close things down have, are the proximate cause of people being thrown out of, thrown out of work. What Arnold's proposed, right, is to, again, simplest, my, my simple version is, is to allow people to access a line of credit at their bank through their checking account that is roughly equal to what they what they put into that account in wages in January and February. This is a really interesting idea. One, it, it, it doesn't, you know, and, and the idea would be you get the line of credit and you can slowly pay it back right afterwards. Um, it, it avoids getting the government involved in the ways that it has. It, it, it avoids creating a quote, stimulus or relief package of $2, million, $2, billion, $2 trillion that contains within it a whole bunch of pork where people have, have engaged in this rent-seeking process where they're using this as an opportunity to, to persuade Congress to fund their pet project. If we really were really going to give people $2,000 a person times $350 million, right, it doesn't add up to $2 trillion. It just doesn't. <laughs> So there's a lot of nonsense in that bill. Arnold's proposal get, just wipes that all off the table and says, says all right, we're, because this is a liquidity problem, right? This is keeping workers liquid while they are not getting paid. And so how could we do that? Give them access to a line of credit, very low interest rate or whatever, right? And based on their earnings. And it's pinpointed, right? So, you know, so you're, you're, you're getting what you're earning. You're not getting any more. You're not getting any less. You're getting what you're earning. And you can adjust that for seasonality and things like that. So I think that's a, to me, that's a sensible proposal. I do think if that doesn't work, you know, of all the things that, all the times where it might be justifiable for government to, to help out workers in the ways that we're talking about, this seems like it, it, it's on the, that side of the line. I don't like it, right, for the same reason we were talking about earlier. I don't like it. And, and the reality of it is, of course, if you do it, you're going to get all that rent seeking, you're going to get a mess out of it. And so the question is, are we really, you know, in the end, how much good are we really doing? Maybe enough to matter. But I think Arnold's proposal is interesting because it can avoid some of that stuff. The other thing I think is important here too is, a, is, is uh, extending credit to businesses. If, if government has a role here, uh, it is opening up lines of credit to businesses in a similar sort of way to help them get through, small businesses in particular, to help them get through this by having access to resources to pay the rent and just keep the thing going until April or May or whatever it is. I'm okay with that. Uh, I, I, I don't want to see them turned into grants and then become, because then we've got, you know, the rent seeking problems and all that. But, but super low interest rate loans that, again, firms can pay back hopefully later on. I think that's, that's the model I would prefer is the sort of lend and provide liquidity. I mean, we're, you know, we're in a way, weirdly, I hadn't thought about it till this point, weirdly acting like, like a central bank to banks here, right? And trying to keep them afloat 
through this liquidity crisis. That's, that's I think, the best way to think about, it, about what, what we're doing right now. Yeah, of course, the likelihood of a proposal like the one we're just discussing is right, probably right. precisely because low. it doesn't provide <laughs> it doesn't provide the rent seeking opportunities that the current one does. That's that's the you know as, as our friend Pete Becky would say, you got to endogenize it, right? It's it's <laughs> it's part of the model, right? And you can't you can't pretend it isn't. And he's right. I can hear him yelling that as he I listens to this later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. All right, we're about out of time, so I have one last very general question for you, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of a fun one and not, I suppose, necessarily anyway, related to uh, the current crisis. Adam from Houston says, any suggestion for a good economics book for high school students taking their attention span into account? Well, you know, the, the ones I did for for EconLib, there was that list of, of intro books. I actually think that for a high school student, Howie Bacher's Free Our Markets might, might be the best choice. It's, it's, it's written at a very accessible level. It's, uh, you know, the, it focuses a bit on the 2008 crisis in some ways that feels a bit dated, but the basic ideas in there, I think are, are, are great for a high school student uh, and will get them thinking about things and, 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 and wanting, to, wanting to read more. That would be, That'd be probably the first one off the off, off the top of my head I can think of. I'm trying to think what else is on that list. I honestly can't remember. But my recollection was in terms of high school students, that's probably the best the best choice. Yeah. Well, your post was more about uh, specifically uh, Austrian economics, yeah. right? But so how, right. And Howie's book, Howie's book is while it has Austrian themes to it, is not so distinctly Austrian that it that it it, it sort of gets in the way. Uh, yeah. I, I think I think it's a it, it covers the main ideas and it. It covers them at a really accessible, clear level. Cool. We will put a link up to that book when we post, uh, when we post do, the Howie, video. We appreciate it. <laughs> gotcha, Howie. Um, any last words of wisdom, tips, bits of advice, particularly for those people who are teaching economics in times of crisis? Well, yeah, I think, I think you got to, you, you, you can't wobble. <laughs> Right. I mean, I think, I think you gotta, uh, you gotta continue to teach the basic ideas. Uh, you got to continue to teach the role that prices and markets play. You have to recognize that markets aren't perfect and that, that people are suffering and that, that, that you know, things don't adjust instantaneously, and, uh, but that, that any other alternative is going to be worse. And, and that's, that's the key here, I think, that, that, that whatever we do, however imperfect it is, the, the markets and prices and, and, and all of those things uh, give us our best shot. At, at getting through this in a way that that preserves our, our preserves our wealth and, and preserves our, our ability to turn that wealth into health and happiness. Great, Steve. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with My me today. My pleasure, as always, ma'am. <laughs> it's good to see you, uh, and I hope that I see you uh, in real life very soon. Uh, in the meantime, take care and stay well. Okay, take care, everybody.